very warm welcome to you. I'm Hayley Palmer. It's so good to have you here with me on tonight's show because we have the most incredible guest for you. Yes, it is legendary composer Jeff Wayne. And here's what happened when I caught up with him. Jeff, it's such an honour to have you here on the show today. Hayley, hello. Welcome to my studio. I have to say, I've come here and I feel very at home. There's, it's a wonderful place. And uh, yeah. how long have you lived here for? Uh, we've lived here 40 years. God. We moved from London and we had two little girls. Ah. And as beautiful as a house that we did have, we had no garden. Mm. And we felt, no, we've got to find at least a, a house with a, a front and a back garden so they got somewhere to run around. And now we have four children, two sons who were born here. And we wound up with a little more than a front and back garden, as you've probably seen. And a tennis court. And a tennis court, yeah. Because you were telling me about how you play tennis yeah. as well as all of this incredible work that you do. Yeah. No, it's been my sport since about age five. My dad taught me. He was a national standard player and uh, it stayed with me my whole life. I've played up to an international standard as a veteran, uh, played for GB a couple of times. So I'm not sure how a yank fits in that sort of a scenario, but I, I've done it. Um, and I've captained the Hertfordshire men for 35 years, although I stepped down last summer. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Well, it's it's a sport that I love. Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you a game one day, Jeff. All right, baby, you're on. Baby, you're you on. got my saying this on camera. It's not a good <laughs> idea. But you have been incredibly busy. I mean, I've heard mm. lots of things. So what's been going on in your world, Jeff? Well, of late, um, we're preparing another arena tour, which we go out about a year from now. Uh, around Great Britain and it, we've got offers to go outside of, of the UK um, and to mount a new arena tour takes 12 to 15 months oh. yeah so it's not just, just take it out of the box and do it again uh, that's not ever been my goal mm. uh, it's the goal has always been to entertain people in the most current way and to challenge myself in truth creatively to be to feel nourished on a creative level yeah, absolutely. Well, we're going to go into the first song uh, on the show today. I know you picked a couple of songs for us, uh, which we're excited to see your choices. Uh, Paul Simon, You Can Call Me Out. Is that one of your favourites? You Can Call Me Out, indeed. That's from his Graceland album, which, um, you know, I'm sure like millions around the world, I've always been a fan of uh, Paul Simon, initially with Simon and Garfunkel. And I found out years later they both went to the same high school that I went to in Forest yeah. Hills, New York, uh, which is just coincidence. Um, never met them, never even knew they went there until years later. But um, Simon and Garfunkel and then Paul Simon is a solo artist. I think um, he's just a fantastic writer of songs, music, uh, lyrics. And You Can Call Me Al has got a combination of both those elements and uh, humor and the video that he did with Chevy Chase to me is perfection personified because their interactions with each other it's as if it's spontaneous but you know professionally that ain't no jazz that they're playing it is so worked out but it's so entertaining and uh, the backing vocals on the Graceland album and this track you can call me Al is uh, provided by Ladysmith Black Bombazo, mm. who, because I heard Graceland and loved it, I was hearing uh, this a cappella group from South Africa from the township of Ladysmith. And I was fortunate as a result when I did what was in theory a follow-up to the War of the Worlds, which if 14 years later is considered a follow-up, um, that's what it was. And I worked with them on, uh, uh, on two tracks on my Spartacus double album, a week in New York and a week here in my studio. And I've got so many pictures that reflect the joy oh, of working with them. Yeah. Um, and the, the video, though, if you can call me out, is, I think, pure entertainment. On, and the musicality is, is just brilliant. I do have a side story about Ladysmith Black Mombazo. It, it was almost two years after they finished here with me. And I was on a like a tea break here and just reading a newspaper. Uh, and I pick up the, the newspaper and I read that one of the Shabalala brothers, there's Joseph and Headman, who Joseph was the founder of Ladysmith Black Mombazo, but Headman had been murdered. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking back 
they were here not that long ago and full of life. And uh, I called Joseph that same day, and they were in mourning. It's a very large family. And uh, he was the one actually targeted, not his brother, Headman. Um, and the irony, the double irony, if you want to call it that, was that um, we were mixing one of the two tracks that Lady Smith were on. And there I'm hearing Headman and remembering his sort of uh, vitality. Coming back to a more happy note with You Can Call Me Al, um, I have a granddaughter, one of nine grandchildren. Wow. And her name is Alice, and her nickname within the family is Al. But she's ever only known me as calling her You Can Call Me. <laughs> I love mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, we're going to uh, be speaking more to Jeff, uh, find out more incredible stories. You're going to love it uh, on the other side of this. Now, Jeff, I want to rewind because what we want to know is how did War of the Worlds come about? Well, it came about from my dad basically nagging me. He, <laughs> he knew that I had been doing quite well in my career as a composer, producer, touring with some artists that I was also responsible for. And uh, he said, I know you're having a great time, but you always said you wanted to find a story that you just feel passionate about and start with a blank page. And I said, you're right. So he said, let's start reading some books. It's time uh, we, we make this happen. So we, over about a year, we started reading a whole range of books. Many were great books, but some were so long that I couldn't find a way to penetrate them from a musician's point of view until literally going out the night before with an artist that I was his musical director of and producer, David Essex. Um, and um, he hands me this book. He says, you might want to read this on your, your journey. No digital anything in that era. So reading was one of the things that one did, uh, you know, when you're away on a, a long tour. And it was the War of the Worlds. H.G. Wells is the War of the Worlds. And I read it, and it was on one read, Haley, that um, I felt this was the one because it had so much to offer on yeah. a number of different levels to find out that it was still very much in copyright. Mm. And about three months later, again, no Googling who owns this and yeah. how do you find this person type of thing. But it, it took about three months to find a, a law firm in Washington who specialized in doing just that for their clients. And we wound up in a London office with the son of H.G. Wells, Frank Wells, mm -hmm. who also had a brother named Frank, coincidentally, <laughs> um, and with Frank's agents, and present ourselves, sort of setting up our stall, so to speak. And there was two main reasons that eventually that they agreed to sell us the rights. And it, the first one was to explain what I felt about the War of the Worlds, which was to not try to modernize it, set it in contemporary America or anywhere else. Mm -hmm. I wanted to stay true to H.G.'s dark Victorian tale, keep the characters, the main plot lines the same. And the second real uh, reason was that Frank liked that it was a father and son team, which my dad and I were partners on the War of the Worlds. Mm. And from that point, we very quickly were able to acquire all the rights from Frank to the War of the Worlds, with the exception of the original book publication rights and the feature film rights that Paramount Pictures owned at the time. It's right. now in public domain, yeah. HG's story. But at that point, it wasn't. But God. off we went. Wow. I've got a question uh, from one of our viewers. He says, uh, what was your uh, inspiration to create the album from your book? What was your main inspiration? Well, the main inspiration inspiration was, in fact, H.G.'s writing yeah. and the storylines. Now, he used the Martians as an analogy for anybody who invades any country in any form. He was critical of that, including the British Empire, which pretty much was at the peak of its, its expansionism around the world. Mm. Um, but it was still fantasy in the way that he created these amazing brains. They were all brained. And they sort of had three main machines that they traveled in. So they had right. a, a, a giant fighting machine, a handling machine whose job was to handle. The fighting machine was meant to, to fight. And um, a flying machine, which 
did a bit of both, flying, attacking, things like that. But what I actually fell in love with even more so was that the sub-stories were about faith, hope, love, and real people in real places. So when you add the imagination of H.G. Wells's overview of the story, mm. that's what I fell in love with. Oh, wonderful. So I hope that answers your question. Now, we're going to go into uh, your next song choice, which is something that I would have chosen, Jeff, Beyonce. Is that because you're a dancer? Yes, and I know mm. this whole routine that we're going to play now, Single Ladies. Yeah. Well, I mean, I have chosen this. Uh, I don't have any backstory other than I love it. I think it's a, 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 it's a brilliant, great tune, isn't it? It's a great song. It, in today's world of fast cuts and, uh, you know, the beats per minute music have gone up and it's great energy. Yeah. But here's a track from however many years ago now that holds up, I think. Yeah. You know, and um, the song is great. The artist is world class. The production is is just fantastic, mm. and it's just got a plain background. And other than the lighting changing a yeah, bit, it's quite clever, isn't it? It's oh, so it. clever, and on that level, I've chosen it. But then I also learned that it was written with a view to uh, commenting on men who are afraid to commit to relationships oh. like marriage, and uh, that adds another layer to the song. But uh, as a Pop video, wow. Here we go, here's Beyonce. Now I want to talk about something that we touched on earlier, something very exciting, the Spirit of Man tour, uh, visiting different locations. We all want to know the inside info, Jeff. Well, the in inside uh, sort of bump is that generally every time we've toured, and we started in 2006. I've named the tour something that relates to the story, the world outside. Our last tour in 2022 was called the Life Begins Again Tour, simply because we had just come out of COVID and life was sort of restarting. This one is, and in no way does the, the name reflect nor the way we're producing it, like a comment on the world that we're living in, in a direct way. But it's within the work itself. Uh, the Spirit of Man is a duet performed between Parson Nathaniel and his wife, Beth. And you'd think a, a parson would be in your local community, the person you go to when mm. crisis is happening. Yeah. But Nathaniel is the one that goes bonkers first. He can't handle the Martians. So they're the devil to him. But his wife, Beth, is a, a caring, loving person. And she is trying to bring him back from his madness saying there's things worth living for, there's even things worth dying for. Yeah. And it's this duality going back and forth between the two of them uh, before they both eventually perish. But as a name for a tour, I thought this is a good time. As I said, not trying to preach, but there is a world we're living in where there's a lot of hell going on. And mm -hmm. I think the name of this tour is appropriate at this time. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, where are the locations? Where the Pretty locations? much everywhere in the right. UK. Uh, we've been offered some uh, dates in, in Europe. Well, we're going to put uh, details on the screen of how you can get tickets. When is it It starts, Jeff? We start March 2025 right. in the UK. Okay. It goes through April and then we'll see what happens about these other dates. Yes, but you can get your tickets already, is oh, that yeah. right? Yeah, yes. yeah. So don't hang about. Make sure you get... Uh, hold of them. Uh, we're going to go into Hurt, Johnny Cash. Why hmm. do you love this song? Um, I love it because, firstly, it's not a, a song we're all going to get up and dance the night away to. <laughs> it's a very passionate hmm. comment that he's making on basically what was the end of his life. He, he passed just months later, and his wife, June, passed four months be before him. Uh, four months earlier from when he did this song. And um, it's like his last act, his final act. Uh, and you can see it, you can feel it, and you can hear it in his performance and on, on this video. Um, you know, he was a man that was almost larger than life. He, he traveled the world, a combination of angry, but also 
uh, an, a great entertainer, great songwriter, although he didn't write Hurt. Um, and as time wore on, and he had, I believe, diabetes when he, oh. which caused his, his death. Uh, and you just feel it and see it all in this video. His wife, June, is actually in the, uh, the video as well, having, I think, representing, he's, she's watching him, keeping an eye on him, waiting for him to join her in eternity. So it's a very raw, emotional video. Mm. I think it's wonderful. I think the song is wonderful. And he is, he's got a voice for the gods in his own mm. way in his career. But 20 years before that, I was invited to Nashville uh, to attend a, 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 at his own studio, the House of Cash, uh, uh -huh. a, a live presentation of an album he had just finished for Columbia, which happened to be the label that The War of the Worlds was on, although it was called CBS here in, in the UK. Now it's part of Sony. But um, after that, uh, a, a couple of others from, from Columbia who were there at this playback uh, were invited back to his and June Carter's house. And, you know, for me as a musician to mm -hmm. share private time with somebody whose work you admired tremendously, anyway. it was rather special. Yeah. And while the conversation was largely around his and June Carter's careers and life, how they met, occasionally they said, well, what, what's a yank, a guy from New York doing living in, in England? <laughs> So I had to explain myself, but uh, <laughs> it's a memorable day. And then watching his career and eventual, I think this final record, Hurt. Mm, yeah, well, uh, we're going to play it out on the show now and I'll be catching up more with Jeff on the other side of this. I hurt myself today. Now, the original album had an incredible cast. Uh, we want to know who's lined up. Uh, for your new tour. Can you give us any insights, Jeff? Well, the new cast is a bit premature. Right. Um, it's the thing that takes us the longest to do because finding people, firstly, I approach people who I whose work I admire. It starts with that. But then the role itself has to be uh, the right type of material cool. for them. And mm. they'll come in here. In fact, one is coming in on Thursday. Who's uh, that? I can't tell you. <laughs> I tried. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's just out of respect for somebody who might come in. And we've had it a couple of times where it hasn't worked out. So yeah. until it's done, it's not done. And uh, But watch this space. I'm sorry I can't tell you more. Well, we'll have to do another show when we find out, won't we? <laughs> okay. Uh, but there's some amazing uh, tech creatures as well, isn't there? Yeah. And tell yeah. us about that. Okay, well, I mean, it's back to what HGL's created. So I think I mentioned earlier these three giant machines that are mm. part of the story. And we have them all in our show in one form or another. But the the biggest one is this Martian fighting machine whose job in life is to fight. And about half an hour into the story, uh, we see on we have three giant screens and four of them in animated form start to appear from the distance and they get closer and closer to the audience. And you hear the, their giant footsteps, which now are sort of stomping over the audience's head. But a fifth one is then to appear and this one is a physical one and it lands on stage having been hidden up in the gods and it just lands slowly yeah. and uh, it fires its main weapon which is called a heat ray and uh, going back to 2006 when we started it was firing like l laser lights but now in, in the most recent tours it fires real flames yeah. and it goes about 12 rows over the audience I'm on stage conducting and I'm sort of ducking <laughs> as it fires over me. Um, but, you know, really, we only lose about a dozen members of the audience on each show. <laughs> but it's so worth it for everybody else. You know? And what's it like for you when you're conducting? Is it just a, well, a whirlwind? Yeah, it is. Because as a musician, and you can imagine, unless you're doing live work, a lot of your professional life is in a studio. Mm. And no matter how much I love working in the studio with musicians and, and, and our team, I think live work is the zenith for any musician. And conducting my own work is, I am sort of describe myself as like a hovercraft for two and a half hours. My feet don't quite touch the ground. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's and, like a and workout. And also coming down from that as well, because yeah. 
even when I go and watch a show, you know, you get that buzz, don't you? Like that live feel. Oh, sure, yeah. And the, the post-show get-together that we have with the, the cast, the crew, it's uh, a perfect cherry on the cake. Absolutely. Well, I think it's time to go into some David Essex, uh, which I know you have a really good working relationship with him, don't mm, you? I do. Well, I met David when he was, this was about 1972, when he was breaking through as Jesus in Godspell. Ah. in the West End yeah. at the Wyndham's Theatre, if I'm remembering correctly. And it just happened that I was going out with a girl at the time who was also in the show. Ah. So I'd naturally want to hang around and go <laughs> out for dinner after the show sometimes. And th the cast I became friendly with. So it was David and others like Julie Covington, Jeremy Irons, uh, Marty Webb, and, and others. All It was a brilliant show, small production, six uh, six girls, six boys from memory. Oh, right, yeah. So very intimate, but they were all brilliant. Talent. But what led to um, uh, working with David was that because we became friendly, he started doing sessions for me uh -huh. and uh, on all different things from commercials up to the odd film score, etc. But one day after a session that w we finished early on, we're sitting in the studio like we are here and we're just chatting away. And suddenly he says, uh, you know, I've written a new song, and I wonder if I could play it for you. And I thought, well, actually, David, the, the mics are still set up from our session. Yeah. Why don't you go and play the piano and, and sing it? He said, great. So he marches into the studio, except the playing the piano was an almost, because he didn't play the piano. Oh. He picked up a trash bin that was next <laughs> to it, empties it out, puts it between his legs, and he turned out he was a very good is a very good drummer, and he was a drummer in a band and percussionist. So he starts sort of <laughs> making a groove and sings this song, which was really quirky. And the engineer on our session was still there, and I asked him to put on sort of like a 1950s-style echo because there was a lyrical reference to James Dean, the actor. Mm. And uh, that was it. So it was David banging away, singing at the same time with this echo. And to me, it sounded so right, the, the, the hollowness of it all, that um, I really liked it. And uh, that song became known as Rock On, which was our debut single for what became a five-year relationship with him as his uh, producer and arranger Gosh. in the, the days of written arrangements, you know, no computers, nothing. So whatever I'm hearing, I'm writing down. But to me, the core idea of this production was no instruments that played chords, so no guitars, no keyboards, just on the session that we pretty soon after we're back into the studio recording Rock On, I had a bass guitarist named Herbie Flowers, who's a legendary uh, musician, and two others, a drummer and a, a percussionist, both named Barry, Barry Morgan and Barry D'Souza, all of whom I had worked with before, but they arrived promptly, 10 in the morning, Typical session start uh, in those days anyway. And uh, I see them, they're sort of looking around. Hmm. And they turn, and one of them turns to me and says, Jeff, when's the rest of the band coming? And I say, guys, you are the band. <laughs> and they say, I better explain to you my idea of this production, which is wow. really, it was almost drum and bass before there was drum and bass, God. using echoes and mm. other instruments and some backing vocals, but no, none playing chords, not even the, the vocalist. And this record became the first single released. It was very popular. It even got to number one in the in the mm. states. Yeah. David got a Grammy nomination. I won the uh, what was then the uh, before the Brits. It was the New Musical Express Awards for the best produced single of the year. But his charisma and the mm. quirkiness of this record, which I wasn't sure would ever find a voice, did find a voice. And wow became rock on. Wow, I mean, what an incredible story just listening to that. Uh, yeah. We better play the video because uh, how can we follow that? Enjoy. <laughs> now, I have heard that you have another special guest star in your show, uh, Rick Armstrong, who's son of the first man to step on the moon, Neil Armstrong. Is this right? That's right. Yeah. And how did all this come about? Uh, I was introduced to Rick and his wife, Mary, uh, several years ago through a mutual friend who works in Munich at the European Space Organization, who has over the years built up a lot of friendships with 
musicians and very interesting people, Rick mm. being one of them. Mm. His dad, of course, was Neil Armstrong, who was the first man to walk on the moon. So uh, we've spent time together just as friends. I didn't know until really getting to know him more that he was a big fan of the War of the Worlds. He's been to our experience in London. And uh, on the last tour, I sort of very nervously asked Rick if he'd appear in our, what's called our epilogue in right. our shows. It's it's based upon an album, the, the original double album having an ending that the Martians perish mm -hmm. due to uh, human bacteria. So in a way, in a sneeze, they're gone. But the question that H.G. Wells leaves us with is, does the future belong to us or to the Martians? So I jump forward to NASA and NASA controller, played by my dad, by the way, all the voices were my dad, oh. um, and in the, in the tours as well. Mm. Um, uh, NASA controller is talking to all the space stations and uh, suddenly one of them cuts out and the, the NASA controller says, what's going on here? And then he goes to another station and one by one they all conk out because the Martians are returning. One of those space stations is now performed by Rick, uh, and he is oh. our sort of Easter egg. <laughs> uh, and uh, I saw him and, and Mary just this past Sunday right. at the Moonwalkers, which of course is about the first man on the moon and the space program, uh, and we had a good catch-up. Oh, yeah. I love that. Wow. Just, again, incredible uh, stories here on tonight's show. Uh, we're going to go into our forever Justin Hayward um, from the original album, I believe. It certainly is. Yeah. Yeah, Forever Autumn. And uh, Forever Autumn went into the singles charts with hardly any airplay. It just seemed to have a life of its own, no more than two or three days after the release of the album. Uh, and... The invite from Top of the Pops came because it looked like it was going to break for a, a very popular recording. Mm. And uh, we had no video. So, <laughs> and there was a, a rule, I think a musician's union rule, that if you were a solo artist that was with a band that were on record royalties, you could re-record your record in a, a studio of your choice and then come on to Top of the Pops and mime to it. But if you were a solo artist without a band, you had to go on Top of the Pops Live with the BBC Studio Orchestra. And it wasn't in a music studio, it was a TV stage. So the acoustics were what they were, musicians mm. were great, um, but the artist had to uh, do it live and got maybe two run-throughs. I had to reorchestrate for what was a much smaller lineup than I had on, on the album. And so I walked in with all the parts, handed it out to the guys, uh, and the MD, uh, very talented man, uh, gave Justin his two run-throughs, and then he performed it live. And what I always remember is Noel Edmonds was presenting on that night, and he referred to Forever Autumn as, now here's a, a song, something like this, a song that was really a poem set to music. I thought, where did he get that one from? But anyway, uh, my reorchestration just about made its way through. There's a few licks that aren't in it because I didn't have the instruments yeah. for them to play. But Justin did did the charm and the record became a big hit as well as becoming one of our two big international hits from the War of the Worlds. Wow, amazing stuff. We're going to go into the video uh, right now. I'll be catching up with the incredible Jeff uh, for the last time after this. For three days, I fought my way along roads packed with refugees, the homeless. Jeff, I could just listen to your stories forever. I mean, it's just incredible what we've heard uh, on tonight's show. Thank but just you. to remind everybody um, of how they can get tickets, when the tour starts, all the information, just run it by us one more time. Okay, well, you can get your tickets here. I've always wanted to do that, Haley. So uh, that's the place to go. And... Um, it's been a real pleasure chatting to you. Oh, it's such an honour to talk to you. you. And um, we, like I say, it's just incredible uh, what we've learned today and uh, just the music video choices, especially Beyonce. <laughs> that went down well with me. Good. And uh, no, just wonderful. And I know everyone at home um, is really excited to see this. So thank you so much. And My for inviting pleasure. us here. It's just uh, an incredible experience. Uh, it's the wonderful uh, Jeff Wayne, everyone. 
huge thank you, Jeff Wayne. Just wonderful to hear all the stories uh, on tonight's show and a reminder that you can get your tickets uh, on the link below. Now, I will see you same time, same place next week. Stay safe. I'm Hayley Farmer and I'll see you then. Hello, ET.